Donald Mulligan joins us, a lecturer and researcher at Dublin City University School of Communications. Just out of the corner of my eye, Donald, I saw you nodding your head, so I'm taking it that you're a Eurovision fan. Many years standing, I'm, I'm a, a very passionate fan of the, the contest for, for quite a while, as well as occasionally getting to study it too. Yeah, that makes at least two of us. I think possibly my editor is as well. How does the European mm -hmm. Broadcast Union decide who decide who participates? So the, the contest is open to all EBU members and the European Broadcasting Union contains most of the, the European Union, but also contains uh, Levant countries, also contains North African countries. Of course, those countries in many cases have chosen not to enter ever or, uh, you know, very occasionally in, in some cases. The only uh, kind of change to that recently was the exclusion, which I think we just heard about there, of Russia. So Russia was previously an EBU member and was excluded from the contest in 2022 following the invasion of Ukraine. And for countries that do take part, how important a stage is it to show the world who they are? I think crucial. I think, and especially for, for perhaps smaller countries, it gives an opportunity to really showcase yourself to Europe and indeed to the world. I mean, Eurovision is watched, of course, very heavily across the entirety of Europe, but in Australia, in the US as well. And it's, it's a chance for cultural diplomacy of a sort, I suppose. Countries can really showcase things about themselves. And often they do uh, when they want to show that they're progressive or they want to show that they're, uh, you know, taking part in, in contemporary Europe. Yeah, I think my daughters, who are elder teenagers now, are still singing that Russian song with the grandmother saying you want some cookies, cookies. You know, these things just stick in yes. the mind. But there was a guest singer. He was a Swede. He was a guest singer who's been there in Malvo performing on stage. He was wearing a Palestinian kefir, the scarf on his wrist. Mm -hmm. And the organizers reprimanded him for that. They said, we reserve the right to remove any Palestinian flag, flags or Palestinian symbols. The thing is, Donald, this shows that for the EBU, just being a Palestinian becomes a political issue. I'm afraid that's, that's probably true. I think there is a really worrying issue happening there where uh, Eric Saada, the, the person who you're, you're talking about, he is indeed a Swedish. He has participated for Sweden before, so he's been an entrant in the contest previously for Sweden. But uh, Eric's father is Walid Saada, who's a Palestinian from Lebanon. And so for him, and he gave a quite clear statement afterwards, the wearing of that kefia was uh, a kind of an acknowledgement of his heritage. And so therefore to... Uh, you know, come down as heavily as the, the EBU has done on that afterwards, I think is problematic. I think there is room for them to really be much less ambiguous about how these, the rules about what is or is not a political act uh, are interpreted, because I think there's, uh, there's great ambiguity about that at the moment. And as was expressed, I, I saw in the previous segment by some of the fans and protesters at the Eurovision, it's frustrating for a lot of people and it, it seems like there are double standards or that, that at least it's very, very confusing. Uh, there are some witnesses who say that uh, during the semi-final on Thursday, when the Israeli lady had finished singing, that there were boos inside the auditorium but that the broadcasters had drowned out the booze. If that's true, that's a little bit bizarre. Um, I, I suspect it probably is true. I, I did see footage from inside the, the stadium and uh, it's not the first time that this has happened. So um, there was consistent booing for many years of the Russian entry when uh, Russia was participating in the contest in previous years. And the EBU was, was known to have created what it termed anti-booing technology, which was essentially drowning out uh, boos and, that were happening in the arena by using crowd sound. Uh, it seems like that uh, probably did occur on uh, the semi-final broadcast yesterday uh, in relation to Israel, but it's not something that's specific to Israel. It's something that has previously happened in the contest before. I know it's a serious matter, Donald, but I just wanted to share with you that I still sing Alan Sorrenti's Tu Sei L'Unica Donna, which is about from 1981. <laughs> Thanks so much, Donald. Really appreciate it. No problem at all.